morning, Grace Church. We're so glad that you're here today. Stand with us. Join with us. The house of the Lord. Here we go. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. Open the prison doors, he parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet, we'll shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord, our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. God who heals, we sing to the God who saves, we sing to the God who always makes a way, cause he hung up on that cross, and he rose up from that grave, our God still rolling stones away, there's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be Shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord, our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet, we'll shout out your praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty, we were the prisoners, now we're running free, we are forgiven accepted redeemed by his grace let the house of the lord sing praise sing it out we were the beggars now we're royalty we were the prisoners now we're running free we are forgiven accepted redeemed by his grace And we won't be quiet. 
This is my testimony. testimony from death to life because grace rewrote my story i'll testify by jesus christ the righteous i'm justified this is my testimony oh i'm alive this is my testimony from death to life because grace rewrote my story i'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. heaven we thank you for loving us we thank you for saving us may you receive our praise from children who love you in jesus name everybody say amen
Father in heaven, we stand in your presence. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your love, your mercy, your kindness. All that you are to us, all that you've done for us, Father, we just give you praise. So, Father, we pray that you would receive that praise from children, from broken children, from weary children, but children who love you. May you fill this place with your spirit as we consider your word and what it means to us. You would bless us in the study of your word, that we might honor you in the lives that we live because of your word. So, Father, in these moments, receive it, and we receive blessing from you as well. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, welcome to Grace Church. We're really glad that you're here. Uh, Just a couple of announcements before we move on. First of all, uh, we are launching our new series today, Future Family. And as an addendum to that, uh, we have an intentional parenting class for the next five Wednesdays. Uh, So uh, this coming Wednesday is the first class. If you've not registered for that, you can do that on our website. Or you can just go to the Orange Balloons today in the Commons area, and they will sign you up uh, for that. Child care is provided. There is a cost for the materials, uh, so keep that in mind. Um, Also, if you are new or newish to Grace Church, we have an opportunity called Step In. Uh, And that is a class uh, prepared for you to answer any questions that you might have about Grace, who we are, what we do, and why we do it that way. Uh, You can meet some of the staff and some of the elders in that class. So if that is of interest to you, you can also register for that online or go to the Orange Balloons in the Commons area, and we will put your name on that list for Step In. And then, as always, in front of you in the seat back are three cards and an offering envelope. Those cards are yours to use to communicate to us uh, and to let us know how we can communicate and serve you uh, back. So please use those prayer cards or the Next Step cards, uh, the New Here card. uh, Fill those out. Take those to Connection Point or the Orange Balloons in the Commons area. We'd love to respond to you in any way that we can. And so um, there's also a giving envelope in the back, uh, in the seat back, too, so you can use that uh, as well. So uh, as I said, we're launching into this new series Uh, Today, Future Family, John uh, Becker is coming to share with us today, so would you welcome John to the stage? I wish I could get my students to clap for me when I walk into class. Good morning, everybody. Right before the end of uh, 2023, uh, my friend Dave contacted me about a Bible plan that he had found in the U version of the Bible app. It's a plan to read through the entire Bible in chronological order in one year. It's called the Bible Recap. I know some of you are familiar with it. Some of you are actually going through that yourselves. Dave asked me and my wife, Kate, if we would like to do that Bible Recap study plan with him and his wife, Rachel. And so the four of us, who have been really good friends for 30-plus years, we decided that this was a great way to not only study the Bible but to hold one another accountable and also have spiritual fellowship together. So we agreed to do that. So I just finished the book of Ruth, which is a really interesting book. But after the book of Genesis starts on January 1st, the book of Genesis, the next few books can be a little challenging in the Old Testament. First of all, the timeline for the book of Job actually occurs right in the middle of Genesis which a lot of people didn't realize. So after Genesis 11, we shift gears to the story of Job, which is over 40 chapters long, very long book. And then we return to finish Genesis, and then we dive into Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And what struck me about these five books of what we call the Pentateuch is how repetitive they are. And I don't say that in a negative way, but they are very repetitive. Of course, in Exodus, um, it tells how Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt. Leviticus lays down God's laws for the Israelites. And the book of Numbers, among other things, details the multiple censuses that were taken for the number of people in the Israelite tribes. So, as I said, there's a lot of stuff interspersed in this repetition that God has told Moses that he is to relate to the Israelites. And there's a lot of repetition. For example, did you know that the uh, Ten Commandments actually occur three times in the Old Testament? Some people don't know that. It's in Exodus 20, Exodus 34, and then again in Deuteronomy 5. 
And as I was reading this, it didn't fully hit me why there was so much repetition, why Moses kept saying the same things over and over and over again, until we got to Deuteronomy 6, which is our passage for today. I'd like to ask you if you would stand with me as I read Deuteronomy 6, verses 1 through 9. And I want you to remember, this is Moses speaking to the Israelites, telling them the word that God has given him. It says, now, this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, the promised land, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Thank you. You may be seated. So as Tim said, today we're beginning this four-week series on families, and I know that there are some people who may think this series doesn't apply to them because they don't have kids or their kids are grown and out of the house. But nearly all of us have kids in our lives somewhere, whether they're your own kids, their nieces, nephews, grandchildren. Maybe they're just the kids in the neighborhood that you care about. And all of them need to know Jesus. So I hope you're going to find value over the next four weeks in the message that I share today and that Tyler, Tim, and James are going to share with you over the next three weeks. So do you remember when you were a kid and your parents told you to clean your room? Remember that? And then a week later, they told you to clean your room. And then a week later, they told you to clean your room and so on and so on and so on. Some of you parents in here, I can see the smiles on your face. You're still dealing with that right now. Some of your parents are looking at your kids. I'm catching it out of the side of the corner of my eyes. In fact, did you ever... Did your parents ever tell you to do something one time and then never, never have to tell you to do it again? That's pretty doubtful, and here's why. The things that are important to our parents weren't necessarily as important to us as kids. So as time goes by, if they fail to keep the task in front of us, if our parents fail to remind us, we begin to forget, or we decide not to do it, or we choose to do something else. And we see this pattern where Moses repeatedly instructs the Israelites about God's instructions. It happens with regularity in the Old Testament. So I'm going to give a little history lesson. I know, I know I'm a math teacher. The math lesson's coming later. But right now we're going to do a short history lesson from those first five books of the Bible that demonstrates why Moses repeats himself so often. Of course, his task is to, to uh, keep these instructions, which are the camp commandments of the Lord, in front of the Israelites. But like children... It takes very little time before the Israelites either forget or ignore these commandments and start doing their own thing. We see this in Exodus 32. This is where Moses goes up on Mount Sinai to meet with God and receive the Ten Commandments. He was gone for 40 days and nights. 40 days and nights. Let's look at what happens in Exodus 32 verse 1. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and they said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. There are two phrases in this, this verse that I really like. I love the phrase, this fellow Moses. They speak at, uh, about him as if they don't know him personally. And the truth is that many of them probably didn't. We don't really think about this when we read about the Israelites leaving Egypt. But the Bible tells us there were as many as 600,000 men on foot leaving Egypt. Just the men. 
Most historians indicate that the total number of people in the exodus from Egypt, including women and children, was over 2 million people. So while everyone knew who Moses was because he was the leader, that didn't mean that they knew him or even liked him. And the second phrase was that Moses was so long in coming down. It was 40 days and nights. That's not even six weeks. And in that short time, less than a month and a half, the Israelites assumed that something bad had happened to Moses. They abandoned God and they demanded that Aaron, who was the high priest and also happened to be Moses' brother, make them a little g God, an idol to stand before them in place of God. Now, Aaron, what does he do? He's a man of God. He is the high priest. In fact, when they were in Egypt, Moses was nervous to speak to the Pharaoh, so Aaron went along with him and did the speaking on behalf of Moses. So naturally, Aaron, the high priest, condemns this sinful request and points the Israelites back to Yahweh. Right? Isn't that what he would do? Unfortunately, that is not what he does. He gives in to their demands. He collects their gold jewelry. He melts it down and he creates a golden calf for them to worship. And of course, God is angry. God is with Moses, but he knows what's going on down in the valley. He knows what the Israelites are doing in Moses' absence, and he is ready to bring destruction on them. Moses implores God, please don't punish them. And God relents. He doesn't punish them as he intended to. So when Moses comes down from the mountain carrying the stone tablets engraved with the Ten Commandments, he sees the people dancing around in front of this golden idol, the idol crafted by his brother, the high priest, and he loses his temper. And he throws the tablets to the ground, breaking them at the base of the mountain. Now God did end up punishing the Israelites with a plague, as well as the death of 3,000 men. And after that, the Israelites repented, and they got in line for a while. But in Numbers 11, the Israelites start to complain about their hardships again. This time, God became angry, and he set fire to the outskirts of the Israelite camp. The Israelites saw what was happening. They cried out to Moses. Moses prayed to Jehovah, and the fire died down. Then they complained about the food. They complained about the manna that God was providing for them every single day in the middle of a dry, hot desert. Food every day. Not only did they complain about the manna, but they started reminiscing about the good food they had when they were in Egypt. I guess they forgot about the small detail that they were slaves at the time. God became angry. Moses interceded on behalf of the Israelites. And this cycle, this pattern, continues over and over, over again while the Israelites wander in the desert. In fact, the whole reason that the Israelites were in the desert for 40 years is because they kept disobeying God. The trip from Egypt to the Promised Land could have been completed in 11 days. Think about that. 11 days, a week and a half. And they wandered for 40 years because they continued to complain and disobey God. So God kept them wandering for 40 years, which was long enough for an entire disobedient generation of Israelites to die off. Now what I've been struck by throughout the Bible study is the scope of time that these early books of the Bible cover and the number of leaders that the Israelite people had over these many, many generations. After Moses died, Joshua became the leader of Israel. And the Israelites followed God throughout Joshua's life. Joshua was a godly man. Then Joshua died. Now the generation after Joshua continued to follow God. But in Judges 2, starting in verse 10, we read the following. And all that generation, the generation after Joshua that was following God, all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. That means that they died. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals, who were false gods. 
And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the people who were around them and bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. Now, the people surrounding the Israelites, who were these people? Uh, Some of them were the Philistines. We see the Philistines later with uh, David and Goliath. Uh, The Canaanites, the Ammonites, the Jebusites, among others. And what often happened was that contrary to God's specific instruction, the Israelites would intermarry with people from these other lands, these other non-Israelite people. And when they intermarried with them, they embraced their false gods and their false traditions, and uh, they forgot about the one true God. So you can probably imagine what happens over the next several generations. God punishes the people for disobeying him and worshiping other gods. The people repent. And finally, God raises up a series of judges to lead them. And these judges were not like courtroom judges. They were more like military leaders. Uh, People who were charged with leading the Israelite, Israelite army. So in verse 16 of Judges 2, it tells us, Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they did not listen to their judges, for they whored after other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked, who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord, and they did not do so. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. But whenever the judge died... They turned back and were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them and bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. This pattern continues generation after generation. And it seems like no one takes time to look back at their own history to see why things keep shifting from good to bad to good to bad. That's the end of the history lesson. And by now, I'm sure some of you are asking, well, how does this help us launch a series on the family? And that's a great question. That brings us back to our passage today. Looking back at Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 7, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. Why am I reading this passage to you again? For the same reason that Moses repeated God's instruction to the Israelites. We need repetition. Remember, this is God telling Moses what he is to relate to the Israelite people. And verse 7 says to teach his commands diligently to your children. That means to make sure you're doing it well. And he tells them to teach the children when you're sitting at home, when you are out walking around, when you're going to bed, and when you're getting up. And to me, that sounds like pretty much all the time. We're supposed to be teaching our children about God all the time, in everything that we do. As I said, the history lesson is over, but most of you know that I am a math professor, and so yesterday at Cup of Joy, someone found out I was preaching today, and the first words out of their mouth were, what's going to be the math lesson? I seem to be earning a reputation, and I don't want to let anybody down, so here come the numbers. From an article called, What is Going On with Families in America?, I want to share the following data. In 1937, the Gallup Organization, which is an organization that does surveys, they do polls. We're probably very familiar with the Gallup polls for political um, office and things like that. In 1937, Gallup conducted a survey of how many people in America belonged to some type of religious institution, whether it was a church or a mosque or a synagogue. And at that time, 1937, 73% of the people indicated some type of religious affiliation. 
And in the 63 years between 1937 and 2000, those numbers hardly moved. It kind of leveled out at 70% in the year 2000. In 2021, just three years ago, Gallup did another survey asking the exact same question. And the number of Americans who belong to some form of religious organization or institution dropped from 70% to 47%. In the 63 years between the initial survey and 2000, those numbers hardly moved. But only in 21 years, 23% of people indicated that they do not any longer belong to a religious institution, a church. These numbers indicate a mass exodus away from all religious institutions, especially churches, and no single religious affiliation is exempt from this phenomenon. And this is interesting. Those numbers include people who belong to cults, people who worship false religions, people who uh, believe in Eastern philosophies, Our world, our America as a whole, is declining in its religious participation. But at the same time that people are leaving the church in these high numbers, 9 in 10 people would tell you, 9 in 10 people in America would tell you that they believe in God. 90% would say, yes, I believe in God. Of course, the question then is, what God do you believe in? As followers of Jesus Christ, when we ask someone if they believe in God, Our natural thinking is that we are asking about Jehovah, the God who created all things, the God who sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on our behalf. When we ask that question, that's what's in our mind. But that isn't necessarily what the person hears who you ask the question to. So if they answer yes, you might walk away going, oh, thank goodness they believe in God, and not realize that they might be speaking about an entirely different God than the one true God. In fact, you'd be right to be skeptical of the form of God that America believes in nowadays just by taking a look at what's going on in society. Belief in God, little g God, is all over the place, and it's not controversial to believe in God. In fact, it's well accepted. But what is controversial for many people is to believe that Jesus Christ is God incarnate, the God who became man and walked among humanity for 33 years. That's controversial to many people. And depending on your data source, somewhere between 60 to 80% of young people who were raised in a church-going family are leaving the church as soon as they can. And many of those people refer to themselves as exvangelicals. Exvangelicals. You can see that word up there on the screen. Maybe you've heard this term. The Wikipedia definition of exvangelicalism is this. It's a social movement of people who have left evangelicalism, especially white evangelical churches in the, United, in the United States, for atheism, agnosticism, progressive Christianity, or any other religious belief or lack thereof. And I know there might be some people here who are unfamiliar with the term evangelical. So let me give you a little bit of understanding of what the word evangelical means. Grace Church is an evangelical church. That means that we believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He was born of a virgin. He came to earth to die for our sins. He rose again after his death and ascended to heaven. He is Jesus Christ, God, and the Holy Spirit from the Trinity. That's what an evangelical church is. People who call themselves ex-evangelicals either believed in Christ at one time and have left the faith, or they may have never truly believed in God in the first place and they left as soon as they could. I'm willing to bet that everyone in this room might know someone who has either walked away from their faith or never truly believed in Christ in the first place. And it's really hard when those people are your family members, whether they're your children or your brothers and sisters or your parents, maybe they're close friends. It hurts. Our heart aches over the fact that they're lost. And this number of people who continue to walk away from the church is increasing. It's not a new phenomenon either. The word exvangelical might be a new term to you, but Jesus told a parable in Luke 15 that framed exvangelicalism quite well. We know it as the parable of the prodigal son. 
So, what is it then that's causing the numbers of young people that are walking away from the church to increase? What's causing it? Well, I did a lot of reading and research, and I could actually spend quite a few hours sharing that information from various articles and research studies that you don't want to hear, and I'm not going to bore you with all of that, but I'm going to boil it down to one main thing that we can point to. According to the article I cited a little bit earlier, the author David Nunnery says, genuine faith in Christ is passed through family homes, from parent to children more so than through churches and institutions. In other words, children leave the church because the church has no meaning to them. So the spiritual instruction of our children isn't something we can hand off to the Sunday school teacher on Sunday or the youth leader or even the pastor. It is the parents. We are the ones who must take the active lead in our homes to teach our children to love Jesus. I want to share a graphic from a study by the American Enterprise Institution. This is a secular research group. If you have the uh, uh, program sheet when you walked in, you'll see this image there. And I'm going to put on my professor hat a little bit, and I'm going to pull up my laser pointer. I'm very excited to do this. And I want us to look at this. Yeah, I got a laser pointer. I ordered it especially for this sermon. People People are riding me so hard about being a professor, I decided I'm going to go all in. Hence the professor jacket and everything. This is a uh, study on the decline of religion in American family life. Young adults participated less often in religious activities growing up. So what we see here in this first column, this first group right here, is these are people that attended religious services with their families. And the the far right-hand column is people who were over the age of 65. Okay, people over the age of 65, and you can see that people in this room right now over the age of 65, 52% of them probably attended religious services, which might not sound like a lot, but when you look at what happens in the next group over, the next group is the people who are ages 50 to 64, and that would be my age range. It declines to 47%. Now, I want you to recognize that this is, the age, this is broken out by ages, and they are declining as people get younger. What that means is that the generations are starting to walk away from the church. Does that make sense? Just like what we saw in the Bible. Just like what we saw with the Israelites. In the second column, these are uh, people who said grace or prayed with family at meals. I do think it's interesting that uh, the older folks were slightly less than the next group over, but still, the number of people who pray before meals is declining by generation, by the age. And in the final column, we see people who attended Sunday school or religious education programs like vacation Bible school and things like that. People over the age of 60 were very likely, over 50% likely, to have attended some kind of Sunday school or religious education program. But as we look at the generations, that final column all the way to the left is people between the ages of 18 and 29. And we're seeing only 27% of those people attended some sort of religious education program or Sunday school. It's evident that these younger generations are not receiving the same religious instruction that older generations did. And like I said, this is what happened in the Bible. As the generations went on, they were not getting the instruction of the Lord. Some studies show that for a variety of reasons... Families are spending an average of only 45 minutes a day together. This is part of the reason that we're seeing less of an uh, instruction to the next generation. The amount of time we're spending with our kids is on the decline. And whether it's because of our busy schedules, shifting priorities, or our electronic devices, we don't make time for our kids like previous generations did. And I know that I've been guilty of this myself. In fact, a few years ago, one of my adult daughters told me that because I worked two jobs as a school teacher to make ends meet, I wasn't home enough when she was growing up. And that was a very hard thing to hear because she did not say it with any kindness. She said it with bitterness and resentment. So I'm not standing up here telling you that I did it all correctly. I'm simply reporting on the information 
And I do want to issue a warning about what's going on in our society because maybe someone will hear this and make a positive change in their family life. Over the next few weeks, we're going to learn more about the family and how we can restore, grow, and maintain better family relationships, both with God and with other family members. But I want to pose a question for you to ask yourself that comes from the article I've been referencing. I want you to take this question home with you. I want you to contemplate what your answer might be. This is the only thing on your your, uh, program when you walked in that has blanks for you to fill in if you want to fill this in. Here's the question. What decision do I need to make that will best help my children to find Christ? What decision do I need to make that will best help my children to find Christ? Should mom or dad quit their job so that they can stay at home and be with the kids? Is that something that someone might need to do? Should we go to church? I think that's an obvious one. Should we, and I'm not, I'm not saying that this is, this is a good question, but I feel I need to share it. Should we leave this church and find another church? I don't want anybody to leave Grace, but the reality is we need to find a place where we are growing and where our children are growing. We're all on the same team. We're all on Team Jesus, and we need to be instructing our children well, and they need to be learning. Should we move to a different location where we can be nearer to, um, nearer to a church or nearer to family who can help us? Should we homeschool or send them to private school? That last question is a really hard one. We homeschooled our kids. My oldest daughter hated being homeschooled, hated it. And when she graduated, she said, I will never homeschool my children. Well, she is now the mother of a five-year-old and a two-year-old. And she came to us about a year ago and said, you know, I hated being homeschooled. We said, yeah, you've made that abundantly clear to us on more than one occasion. And she said, but I get it now. I understand why you did what you did. And I think we're going to be homeschooling our kids as well. And there was joy in our hearts. There was a little bit of told you so, but we didn't do that. We didn't say that. But it was gratifying to recognize that now that our kids are parents themselves, they're recognizing the decisions that we made as parents and understanding why we did what we did, even if they didn't like it. It's a tough thing. Send them to a private school, homeschool them. What are you going to do? There are hard questions to ask. There are other questions that you could probably come up with and think on. But when you count the cost of not properly teaching our children about Jesus Christ, They are questions that you must ask. As we prepare for a time of communion, I want to encourage you to come back over the next three weeks to hear Tyler, Tim, and James. We're each going to take a Sunday to share on this topic. And parents, I hope you will consider signing up for the intentional parenting class that starts on Wednesday night. You can go to the events page at connectedgrace.org and you can get that information. Now I'd like for each of us to take just a few moments and reflect on the condition of our heart. Some of us, myself included, might be feeling a bit discouraged over the spiritual state of our children or of our family. If you're feeling that way, just silently reach out to God and ask him for comfort and wisdom. Take a moment right now to offer a prayer to God for family members who are far from him. In Psalm 139, King David wrote the following. He said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. If you have something on your heart right now that you need to confess to God, you can offer that up to him right now, right where you're sitting. You can ask for his forgiveness. He loves you so much. He wants to extend that forgiveness. Offer up a prayer of repentance right now or maybe just a prayer of gratitude and thankfulness to God.
In 1 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul writes the following. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that on the night the Lord, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Please pray with me. Gracious Heavenly Father, none of us are perfect, but we all desire for our children to know you. Parenting can be hard. Caring for children can be hard. Teaching them to love Jesus can sometimes be hard. But it is so necessary, Lord. We pray that we would be able to do this well, that we would be able to point our children, point the next generation back to you. Lord, we pray that there would be a revival in this country as people teach their children to love Jesus and they teach their children to love Jesus and that we would come back to you as a nation, Father. Thank you so much for the opportunity to worship you here this morning. We love you so much, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust. Amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire time after time. Born of his spirit, Washed in his blood, and what he did for me on Calvary is more than enough. I trust in God. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never never fail. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail.
trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Amen. I sought the Lord with you today. I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered. I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered. I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered that's why i trust him that's why i trust him i sought the lord and he heard and he answered i sought the lord and he heard and he answered i sought the lord and he heard and he answered that's why i trust him that's why i trust him i sought the lord and he heard and he answered, I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered, I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered, that's why I trust him, that's why I trust him, I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered, I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered, I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered, and he answered. trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. I trust in God. Again, Father, thank you for loving us, for saving us giving us a life that is full of hope and joy and peace in your son, Jesus Christ, in whom we love and in whom we serve and in whom we worship. And it's in his name that we pray. And everybody said, amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.